This edict identifies Jesus of Nazareth as a heretic and a blasphemer. This season on The Chosen. There are those for whom this will set off a series of events my followers won't understand. Lazarus, come out! I guess you're not holding back anymore. I can't. I'm out of time. See season four of The Chosen in theaters on February 1st, starting with episodes one, two, and three. Get your tickets now at thechosenriseup.com. Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery again, History of Tea Part 5 today with a special focus on the Tang Dynasty luminary Lu Yu. I was a little reluctant to mix Lu Yu in with the last episode and wanted to showcase his life and the Cha Jing, the classic of tea, in one single episode. Namely, this one. I won't say that Lu Yu's life was as legendary and mythic as Shen Nong, but it was... Twelve centuries ago when Lu Yu walked this earth, so it's one of those things, who knows how much, if any, of this tale is true. So without further ado, let's get right on it. All my sources said he was a Hubei Ren. Born 733 in what is present-day Tianmen, Hubei province, between Wuhan and Jingmen. Like with many of today's places in China, back in Lu Yu's day, it wasn't called by its present name. He was abandoned as a child, left under a stone bridge, and he ended up growing up under the care of the abbot of Longkai Temple. The abbot, Jirji, raised him as his son, and together with others inside the monastery, served as Lu Yu's tea mentors for all those earliest formative years. The roots of Lu Yu's passion for tea were planted here at this Chan Buddhist monastery. I mentioned earlier that Chan Buddhism is better known by its Japanese name, Zen. Now, the way the script was written by his stepfather, Lu Yu was supposed to stick with the monastery and embrace the life of a monk. But Lu Yu had other plans in mind. The abbot's problems began after he had placed Lu Yu in the care of a family who taught him classical learning, Confucian values, and philosophy. Lu Yu favored this much more than Buddhism. And no matter how hard Lu Yu's father, the abbot, tried to push him towards Buddhism and away from Confucian learning, he just couldn't do it. So to compel Lu Yu to toe the line and to embrace Buddhism, Lu Yu's stepfather used forceful ways, punishing him by making him do all the most menial and degrading of tasks in the monastery. So 14-year-old Lu Yu, after saying enough of this, ran away. He picked up and left, joined the circus, and became a clown. But being a circus performer wasn't the life for Lu Yu any more than it was for Moisha Cohn back in 1907. So Lu Yu didn't last long in the entertainment industry. However, being in the entertainment business did have some perks. You never know what kind of interesting people and role models you might run into. Lu Yu received a good education in the circus, He was a natural man of letters, too, and, of course, tended to prefer to gravitate towards people who were also literate and learned. A member of the Tang royal family, Li Qi Wu, for one insubordination or another, got banished to Tianmen as the new governor. Tianmen wasn't considered a prestigious posting, at that time in the Tang dynasty, anyway. Despite his banishment, Li Qi Wu put on his best face, and went down there. Of course, he sought out the local entertainment, and wouldn't you know it, so enamored was he with Lu Yu's performing skills when he visited the circus, he sought him out for further conversation. This Tang royal, Li Qi Wu, then took Lu Yu under his wing and provided him with mentorship and the use of his library to further his studies. Now, the period growing up in the monastery until the time he began writing the Cha Jing were Lu Yu's most formative years. Not only did Li Qi Wu guide him at a crucial time in his life, others too, Zhou Fu Zi and Cui Guo Fu, served as Lu Yu's other teachers. These two were other respected Tang men of letters, one a teacher, the other a poet and calligrapher. So Lu Yu became a man of letters himself, and in no time at all could hold his own against other gifted literati of the day. He had built up a modicum of high repute for his writing and for being, as William Eukers described, quote, 
a colorful personality of high abilities and versatility. End quote. Lu Yu spent his 20s traveling far and wide to 32 tea-producing districts in China. This stretched from the region west of the Chengdu Basin in Sichuan all the way to 8th century tea heaven, Jiangsu, Zhejiang, and Jiangxi. And all along the way, he had collected samples, talked to the locals, compared processes, and noted everything he saw. During his travels... Lu Yu had wandered down to the land of Ba. You remember the Ba Shu states centered around Chengdu and Chongqing, Tea Part 1. This is considered the birthplace of tea cultivation. Lu Yu studied this place and took notes wherever he went. He found solace at Miaoxi Monastery in Huzhou in Zhejiang Province. There he worked alongside the Chanong, or tea farmers, working on the hillsides, and he befriended a Chan Buddhist monk named Jiao Ran. Jiao Ran was famous for his tea poems. Jiao Ran, Li Qi Wu, Zhou Fu Zi, Cui Guo Fu, they all had an impact on Lu Yu's education and literary prowess. And by this time in the Tang, the world of letters and learning went hand in hand with tea culture and knowing how to enjoy it. Exposure to all these tea people who knew so much about tea was the stuff that gave Lu Yu the chops to authoritatively write something like the classic of tea. This monk, Jiao Ran, was said to have been another one of Lu Yu's main mentors in the arts of preparing tea, serving it, and all about the importance of the tea ware. Jiao Ran was in many ways the one who was the guiding spirit behind Lu Yu when he began writing the Cha Jing. As the story goes, the reason Lu Yu wrote the Cha Jing was because he had received a commission from some tea merchants these men in the tea business, eh, who knows if it was a, a guild or how this group came together, they thought it would be good for everyone if they could put out an easy-to-read, simple, all-inclusive guidebook to everything one needed to know about tea. That's what the Cha Jing, the classic of tea, was all about. It was written as an 8th century infomercial on behalf of the tea industry. So far in examining the history of tea, we've looked at all these various documents going back to the contract from Wang Bao, where in 59 BCE, tea and a tea market were specifically mentioned. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, as tea use in China developed, there would be references made to tea that gave an indication about where tea was as a beverage, a medicine, or a muse at that time. To get an idea about how tea culture was progressing, Historians have had to sift through all the documents to study this and that document that mentioned tea. But up to the time of the Tang, there was still no all-in-one guidebook that spelled it all out succinctly. And now, with Lu Yu's Cha Jing, the classic of tea, here for the first time, everything about tea was contained in one slender volume written for both experts and novices. And because of his writing skills that he had acquired growing up these past years with some pretty smart people, it was written as elegantly as it was simple. Lu Yu was perfectly suited to perform this task. He was at a stage in his life where he was a brilliant mind looking for some meaning in life and to strike out and make a difference. And this commission from these tea merchants turned out to be the perfect opportunity to write something he was eminently qualified to do and at the same time leave his mark in China. His accumulated learning and passion for tea from his early days at Longkai Monastery, his Taoist and Buddhist core values and beliefs, his skill as a literatus acquired during his patronage by Li Qi Wu, his travels and the times he lived in, Everything combined together in Lu Yu's person to give us the Cha Jing. In 765, this was during the unstable reign of the Tang Daizong Emperor, he had the first draft of the Cha Jing ready for release to these merchants. But Lu Yu believed the Cha Jing wasn't complete yet and something was still missing. So in 766, a deal was reached with his sponsors to release the work in its present unfinished form, but in a limited run. In all, it would take Lu Yu a good 26 years to complete the classic of tea in its 
final form. Through his old acquaintance, the Buddhist monk Jiaoran, Lu Yu hooked up with a noted Tang official, calligrapher, and all-around literatus extraordinaire named Yan Chunqing. This is around 777 CE. Yan Chunqing was compiling books and documents for an imperial library for the Daitong Emperor. Lu Yu was one of the many scholars invited to participate in this project and to examine and study firsthand all these ancient documents that needed categorizing. And it was during this scholarly endeavor, pouring over these scrolls, that Lu Yu learned for the first time all the forgotten tea history going back to Shannong's time. All of this was new to Lu Yu, and in reading about Ti and the Sui, the Southern and Northern Dynasties period, the Jin, the Three Kingdoms, Han, and even as far back as the Zhou, Lu Yu noted everything. In acquiring all this new information, he felt, at last, he had everything he needed to complete the work he had left unfinished for more than a decade, going back to the year 766. Under Yan Chunqing's generosity and hospitality, Lu Yu returned to the Cha Jing and finished it off, inserting all the history of tea into the work. On behalf of the Daizong Emperor, Yan Chunqing tried to recruit Lu Yu into government, but Lu Yu, who had already returned to the south, would have nothing of it. He was the sort that liked to be out in nature, enjoying tea rather than living a life in a cubicle in the royal palace. Nonetheless, he took the return trip north to Chang'an to thank Yan Chunqing personally for recommending him to the emperor like he did. En route, Lu Yu turned this sojourn into another tea vacation. He stopped along the way at any tea-worthy village or garden, and wherever there was a mountain stream whose water was said by the locals to be regarded in high repute, Lu Yu would go there too. His alleged expertise in being able to recognize water purity is all part of the whole Lu Yu legend. He kept finishing and polishing the Cha Jing during this time, the late 770s. And then by the year 780, it was in its final form. By Chinese reckoning, this was the year 3478, the year of the metal monkey. This was the year work began on Borobudur, the largest Buddhist temple in the world, located in central Java. <laughs> Man, Buddhism was uh, big in the 8th and 9th centuries. So, 780, the Cha Jing, the classic of tea, was released to the Tang general public. Everything about tea, the water, utensils, was categorized, listed, explained, and recommended with anecdotes. The impact this manual had on Chinese tea society provided instant benefits to the people who used it. The Cha Jing, when it came out, needless to say, was an instant classic. There was no sad or tragic story about Lu Yu. He became an instant celebrity and was even sought out once by the Tang Emperor De Zong. Lu Yu, he lived on for another 24 years beyond the publication of the Cha Jing in 780. He lived to see paintings of himself and Lu Yu statuettes placed in tea shops and tea houses throughout the land. Lu Yu would later produce much more than the Cha Jing as far as his whole body of work, but eh, like so much from this age, not too much has survived the ravages of man and nature. But we did get the Cha Jing, so we should be thankful for that. And like so many documents from these times, no copies of the original work survived. The Cha Jing was a complete primer on tea culture. It touched on the horticultural aspects, plucking, processing, the tools, everything, all in one slender volume. Actually, back then, it came in three volumes and ten parts, but... These were scrolls and not bound like books we know in our wild and crazy times. But it was indeed slender, only 7,000 Chinese characters long. Lu Yu's Cha Jing created quite a revolution in China as far as tea culture and the, the whole integration of tea into Chinese daily life. In order for the tea supply to keep up with the growing national demand, tea farmers had to migrate closer to the population centers in the east. Downriver, along the Yangtze, wherever the growing conditions were right, new tea cultivation began, with Buddhists and Taoists usually leading the way, from seed planting to plucking. It only took three years, so 
the ramp-up phase of any tea garden venture was relatively quite fast. The Cha Jing remained a stalwart in every educated person's library for 955 years. It wasn't until 1735, the final year of the hard-working Qing Emperor Yong Zheng, that uh, Lu Ting Tan, another Cha Xian, or Tea Immortal, wrote the follow-up to the Cha Jing and brought everything Lu Yu had written in the brick tea world of the Tang Dynasty up to date. A lot had happened between 780 and 1735, and this supplement to the Cha Jing, called the Xu Cha Jing, was a long time coming. Xu Cha Jing simply means the sequel to the Cha Jing. There were countless other treatises on tea and tea culture that came out or had been alluded to in other texts. We'll mention others as we make our way through the Tea History podcast, but many of the older texts suffer from Xia Dynasty Syndrome. We heard of them, they're written about, but none of these documents exist in any collections, public or private. There's no real historical evidence to prove many of these documents' existence or what information they contained. As short and skinny as the Cha Jing was, it had a lot going on. Lu Yu didn't just offer a step-by-step instruction guide on how to make tea. The spiritual aspect of tea was particularly emphasized by Lu Yu. He was insistent that serenity, oneness with nature and the universe, complete peace and focus was a necessary component of making, serving, and drinking tea. Lu Yu emphasized that the environment where you were drinking tea mattered very much. The entirety of the tea experience had to be a serene moment. The preparation, the ingredients, the water, the teaware, and the tea leaves themselves. Everything needed to be just right and in tune with one's inner harmony. The act of making, serving, and drinking tea was the outward form of all this combined inner harmony. You achieve this inner harmony through the focus and attention you put into this act of preparing and serving tea. Inner peace can be achieved through focusing on the seemingly mundane and its importance in what you are doing at that specific moment. Lu Ting Tan's work followed a similar structure to Lu Yu, but by this time, in the Qing it was already a loose tea world, and in Lu Yu's day, eh, they were still scraping bricks of tea. By the way, Lu Ting Tan and Lu Yu, though sharing a common surname, were not related. His sequel to the classic of tea, the Xu Cha Jing, was a much longer book. In addition to bringing Lu Yu up to date, it also provided commentaries on all the various tea treatises since the Tang. And we'll look at many of them uh, in the episodes to come. So all the rituals involved in the process were codified, and a reason was given for everything. Lu Yu borrowed from both Confucianism and Taoism in producing this work. For this work and his personal contribution to Zhongguo Cha Wenhua, Chinese tea culture, he's forever referred to as the Cha Sheng, or the tea saint, or tea sage. He's also considered as the first apostle of tea in China. Next episode in Part 5, we're going to take a look at the classic of tea and peruse these chapters written twelve and a half centuries before. I guarantee you, this is one episode you will not want to miss. So let's put the bookmark in here and finish up with the tea saint in the next episode. Before I go, let me insert one shameless plug here to cajole all of you to go check out the China History Podcast, the longest-running show of its kind on the internet. There's more to Chinese history than tea, and I cordially invite you to go check it out. It's available in all the same places you can find this show. So, until the next time, mis amigos y amigas, this is Laszlo Montgomery wishing you all a fond ado and entreating you to consider coming back next time for what's shaping up to be another lurific episode of the Tea History Podcast. <laughs>